What's going on, everybody? This is another episode of the Facts Project. My name is James Graham, Master Facts Voice. Thank you for joining me today. And to get right into it, have you been watching What If? Now into episode two. And this one, good God. I mean, it was only right that it was going to pull at your heartstrings because this episode was the integration of T'Challa joining the Guardians of the Galaxy, replacing Peter Quill with T'Challa. And the way that it was constructed was fabulous. It was pretty much overall within the 30 minutes, a very optimistic view on what life would have been like if T'Challa, somebody of high standing, somebody of extreme morals, somebody of that ultimate positive attitude would have joined the Ravagers, joined Yandu, and ultimately just constructed himself, constructed, constructed himself into just being the leader that he is, although being an outlaw with the Ravagers. So like when we pick this up, and for those of you that haven't seen the episode, I, I, I'm i so sorry, but I'm going to spoil the shit out of this. <laughs> but ultimately, um, how this is put down is that T'Challa, of course, it, in the replacing of Peter Quill, it's not the necessary like constructs of where Peter Quill's mother dying of cancer, him running, running out of the hospital into the middle of a field to the point where he gets picked up by Yandu and the Ravagers and gets brought on all these intergalactic adventures. No, that doesn't happen. For what we have it, T'Challa, of course, has lived until the year 1988 um, in Wakanda, and he's very curious about the world and exactly what it is beyond the walls of Wakanda. Because, of course, they're built inside of this fortress, away from the world, hidden from the world. And he's a curious little kid. So ultimately, it's him going beyond the borders of Wakanda and therefore getting picked up by the Ravagers. And in doing so, it, he doesn't even seem at first as being this scared little kid. He's so curious about what's out there and it's not even it's not even the aspect of him wanting to see the outside world it's like yandu just basically gave this little kid the present of all presents and i'm not only going to take you away from earth i'm gonna show you millions of planets and the upbringing of him is as star lord seems more genuine than than he could have imagined as a matter of fact, it just changes the timeline so much. It's almost like a what if, it's almost 10 what ifs within this what if. Because T'Challa, T'Challa just being that person within joining the Guardians of the Galaxy ultimately constructs all the people that you know throughout that movie, throughout that timeline, and even throughout the MCU as being mere positive subjects of who they were in the past the first the first inclinations of him on um, Mordor and um trying to get basically the power stone out for the first time and it's the same it's the same background and then Cor um Corden and the uh Cordo and the Kree army approach him of course voiced by Jaiman Hansu and instead of them not knowing who Star, Star Lord is Star-Lord is more so revered and known throughout the galaxy so much that everybody just wants to be wants to be around him, wants to be with him and it's almost an honor to be in his presence. <laughs> and even so like T'Challa um even in the bowing segment. So like uh, Cordo decides to bow in front of him and he's like, no, we don't do that here. Almost in the same breath that Banner, when he arrived in Wakanda, when Bruce Banner arrived in Wakanda and he asked um, James Rhodes, should I bow? And he was like, yeah, of course, man, he, he's a king. And, and you know, the child is like, no, no, we don't do that here. It almost looked like the same exact thing, which was hilarious in that aspect. And you know, pretty much 
he's there for recruiting tools, even though Corden like kind of like hinted, hinted at himself. be like, hey, if you're ever looking for somebody new, I'm your man. And he kind of hints that, oh, we're booked up right now. To the point where they get in, get into this altercation, but the altercation is more so an honor than anything, like I talked about earlier. And <laughs> he ends up taking them anyway. Because most of the, the Cree faction that was uh, waiting for them outside, Yandu, of course, being the ultimate. It, it seems like every time that Star-Lord, whether it's Peter Quill or T'Challa, was in trouble, you know, Yandu being the father figure that he is to Star-Lord, r- rather who it is, is always there to back him up. But ultimately, we get set forth on this journey. And this journey, when they when they arrive, uh, arrive on this heavenly ass planet, and they're having a little like party section. Of course, you know it's not like the Ravagers going to go meet some of uh, some pleasure pleasure bots as they used uh, as they did in uh, Guardians Two. No, they get met at this bar. Um. Oh, and, and before I get to before I get to that planet scene, note that he did. Um. When he finally arrived there. You know, the the setting of it was just that much great. Drax was the bartender, but which was excellent. And and no, it is not David Batista. He is the only voice in this series within this episode that is not playing themselves. So we get the introduction of Nebula. Of course, that's Karen Gilliam. She gets a whole new look. She looks like she has not been tortured by her ever loving adopted father, Thanos. Throughout these times, as a matter of fact, she's grown a like a whole head of hair, like some blonde hair. And who else has joined the Ravagers? So you got Corden, um, you got Yandu, you see Drax at the bar. He's not even like fitting into the mold of the Guardians. His family has been saved. His his wife and his daughter did not die in order for him to strike this mission of rebellion against Thanos. And He's just playing a role like he's like it's like he got a job, (laughs) which is which doesn't even seem like something that he would do. I mean, especially in the comics. I mean, that's not what he was made for. But inevitably, the main person that you see, of course, that is joined the Ravagers. Gamora is not in the picture. Thanos has joined the Ravagers. Now, I've read a couple comics, of course, where Thanos has joined the Avengers. But the ways, the way that uh, Thanos has joined the Ravagers is merely not from a toe to toe with T'Challa. He talked them out of it. Like the fact of uh, drawing the entire galaxy into uh, a a means of genocide, so that fifty percent of the and his whole thought process in his head to where fifty percent of the population in the galaxy had to just go away in order to uh, collect the infinity infinity stones in order to make this happen. So Chala just had to sit down with the man and talk them out of it because, and I know that kind of like steered a lot of people the wrong way. I remember I talked to a couple of friends of mine that said that they hated that part, that, that Thanos just sat at the table with them and, you know, that basically T'Challa just steered this man on a righteous path. And it didn't seem like it makes sense to them. I thought that was awesome because inevitably, yeah, you force the child's hand. He's going to whoop your ass. But to know that somebody of that powerful of a presence can merely have a sit down with the mad Titan. And he can honestly have this conversation with, with him in order to say that makes sense. You know, <laughs> and it, it, that's what that, that's exactly what happened. So in the means of that, you know, we, we get into this point where uh, they're concocting this plan. And it's all spurred on by Nebula. Nebula, of course, has a debt with the collector. And they feel as though uh, with the trading of the power stone that, that maybe they can come to an amends. So we get down to the nitty gritty. The Ravagers arrive at the, uh, I forget the name of the, uh, the name of the place. Uh, Actually, I'm sorry. Damn. 
it's nowhere, which is the celestial head that, of course, re- is revered in the Guardians of the Galaxy uh, 1 and 2 and also uh, appeared in Endgame. Um, so we get there, the collector, of course, showcasing uh, some of the things that he's collected over time. Howard the Duck being one of them, uh, a dark elf being another one, Cosmo, the, uh, the astronaut dog, of course, being the other. And when he gets met with uh, Howard the Duck, of course, the banter starts to happen. And he's telling them exactly where, you know, where they can find the, uh, I, I believe it's called the Eternity Crystals. And Howard the, Duck, Howard the Duck is basically like telling them exactly where it's at. And he just realizes, okay, let me let this man free. He knows exactly what he's doing. And Howard the Duck just, he, he, he absolutely did the right thing because he took the man to have a drink. Because that's exactly what Howard needs. You know what I'm saying? And in this aspect, of course, um, we get met with the collector. The collector, of course, being one of the elders of the universe, brother of of the Grandmaster from Thor Ragnarok. And he is completely different. Not only is he utilizing his collection uh, just as a means to be the uh, greatest person at a comic con that holds all type of collectibles known to man he's actually using them to benefit his his evil doing so he's constructed himself in a way of course he's a lot more built than he was uh when he showcased himself in the first guardians movie and let alone in infinity war bro got built and the fur coat the aesthetics on on uh the collector looked like they matched to a t and not only has he collected, you know, like uh, some of the some of the greater beings of the galaxy, but a lot of similar or familiar weapons that we have seen in the MCU in the past, namely Captain America's shield, uh, a dark matter knife from Malekith from Thor 2. You saw Mjolnir, uh, Thor's hammer in the background as well. And. Last but not least, I don't know where the hell he got Hella's uh, helmet. He put that shit on, man. He started to go for broke. And you, and and even in the midst of all that the collector is throwing at T'Challa, man, the dude is holding his own. I know this is animation and everything like that, but damn. And even in the fact that he got the chance to dip off, you know, we have to realize and cut to the fact that, you know, this was one of the last projects that Chadwick Boseman had put together. And inevitably, you know, him taking on the role of Black Panther drew up such an inspiration for a, not only a, a lot of comic book fans, because he played the part to perfection, but in his heart of hearts, he just made it so he continued to be an inspiration going forth, regardless if, if, he, if he was going to be in Black Panther or any other roles aside from that. So it was good to hear his voice. And inevitably, like the story of Black Panther derived from family, the, um, the coexisting relationship between father and son, his, his uh, father, T'Chaka, that scene where he's on the plane because he he always felt that you know not necessarily that he was abandoned by by Wakanda but that even though he was gone they had forgotten about him and of course Yandu lied to him just like he did Peter Quill and inside of a Wakandan ship he came to realize that T'Chaka went on an endless pursuit of looking for T'Challa the entire time sent planes for him throughout the galaxy. Please note that Wakanda, although a sovereign nation depicted on earth, the galaxy conquest that they go on in the comics, if anybody has never read those, the intergalactic empire of Wakanda written by Ta-Nehisi Coates, please read it. Note that these people have been exploring space longer than we could have imagined. (laughs) 
but those those were the touching moments um and and it it set off a very positive salute to to, to um Chadwick Boseman as an actor and what he meant to that role as T'Challa you know cuz throughout this fight of course uh we got all these all these parts that we've seen throughout a lot of the characters within the MCU they end up getting off of the planet and Ultimately, it led him back to Wakanda, back to Earth. And at the end of this story, of course, you have Thanos, Nebula, um, you have Yandu, T'Challa going back to Wakanda. It's all about togetherness. And it's just it was like an ebb and flow that you kind of realize this is what T'Challa does. Like he brings people together like it, it was almost. It was almost like a utopia that if T'Challa would have stayed in the MCU, which I'm sure that he is in some form or fashion, they can. I don't never feel that they could get rid of that character. That in my heart of hearts, I feel as though that would be the standpoint of what T'Challa would be. You know, it's. I understand that the main protagonist throughout the entire MCU has always been Robert Downey Jr.'s character of Iron Man. I get that. You know, but what T'Challa meant when he got entered into the fold and was put in place meant a lot. It was a power shift because of what he represents, because of what the Black Panthers represent to Wakanda and what Wakanda meant for as a as a fictional place, it meant as the plight of a people who maybe never thought that they could get there. And it was it, it, it was a good time. And and inevitably, you know, shifting back in the topic, when we when we see these what ifs and how they're going to interchange. Uh, character descriptions, they're going to interchange um, exactly what we would see if we just replace a character and how that would shift the story. Inevitably, they have to get to a, an epicenter, a, catas- a cataclysmic event, exactly how they did with Infinity War and Endgame. So how do I see this playing out is the fact that the What If series is pretty much copying exactly how the MCU went, not necessarily in periodical order or anything like that. It's giving us exactly what we need with a lot of different stories. So uh, you you're still going to get Marvel zombies is going to come up. Iron Man meets Killmonger, Uh, Spider-Man. What if Spider-Man was Dr. uh, Dr. Strange or what if Spider-Man was the Sorcerer Supreme? It has to reach some type of climax. I believe there's going to be a an episode where um, if Vision and Ultron merged, which is kind of like what Iron Man kind of desired. And then even more so after that, there's going to be a storyline where the ultimate conqueror and antagonist with, within the series is Gamora. So is she going to be the one to band all these multiversal characters together to fight in an epic battle? You know, we saw the black order in this episode and I thought that was dope too, but you know, inevitably it has to reach a finale. And when it does is it, yeah, yeah, it's not going to have the same effect as end game, but if the plan set forth for all of this to happen, because the connectivity between the last series that just played, like I, like I said in the last episode with, uh, with Loki, and then we get to this one of series to show you what the multiverse looks like. It has to, it has to reach some type of finale. And I feel as though that's the only way it's going to play, but let me know what you guys think. Because I think this what if series, I like it just as just as if anybody had read those comics when you were very young, 
it's always compelling because everybody has their own interpretation of a story. Me and somebody else can read the same book and probably have two different viewpoints, depending on our personalities. But what Marvel has done with that series, what they did with that series, was if I was to just switch a character that has a different personality, how different would the story be? And that's awesome. But I'll be looking forward. We're going to continue this going forth. We're going to do this with episode three. Thank you guys for joining me on the Facts Project podcast. Please, please do support a lot of indie podcasters out there. Please feel free to support myself. I am James Grandmaster Facts Voice. You can find me, the Facts Project or Grandmaster Facts on Twitter. And you can watch this episode on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you find your favorite podcast. So, for all of us at the Facts Project, we are out.